Hi, this is Naharka with another SAT Biology video. Today we're going to focus on ecology, so for all of you guys studying my videos to take the bio e-test, you really, really want to pay attention to this guy. Um, for those taking bio M, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but it's possible that you're going to get a couple questions, so I would just watch the video once, remember a little bit, move on with your life, don't study this too much. So first we're going to start our conversation with the levels of biological organization. So this goes cell, tissue, organ, organism, population, ecosystem, biome, and biosphere. So we're going to start by defining population as a group of individuals in a particular area that interbreed. So remember before we talked about a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed, but a population includes the organisms that actually are interbreeding. So remember, evolution acts on the population as a whole, because evolution can't act on one individual. You don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm evolving today. So population growth occurs in two ways. The first type of population growth is exponential, where your growth seems like it's never going to stop. It keeps going up. And usually what will happen after you have this exponential growth, you have a period where it ultimately does reach a level where the population is unable to sustain this huge rapid growth at once and once this level is reached the entirety of the population growth graph is known as limited growth instead so the maximum population size where the graph tapers off is known as the carrying capacity and that's the point at which the environment can't handle any more organisms so now we're going to define a community as a group of populations in the same environment. So this isn't necessarily an ecosystem, but it is a little bit bigger than a population. So to understand competition within a community, we need to talk about what a niche is. And so a niche is a way that an organism lives within its environment, whether it eats small seeds or it lives in the tree at night or <laughs> anything like that. So that's what a niche, that's some examples. So if two populations have the same niche, there will likely be competition between them for resources. So when one organism devours another, which is possible when regards to competition, it is known as predation. But this doesn't necessarily have to mean death. So predation can often lead to prey evolving and the predator evolving. So this, an example of this would be a giraffe eating a plant. It's not killing the plant, it's just eating some leaves. And the evolution that would occur is that the plants have grown to have thorns. They're not grown, but evolved to have thorns. So the evolution of two species at the same time is caught, that is caused by the interaction between them is known as co-evolution. So an example of this would be the trees would grow taller, but then the giraffes would have taller necks. And while this won't work within a couple days, this will work over multiple generations, this is an example of co-evolution. Predators present to in the environment can affect your carrying capacity. If you have more predators, it's really unlikely that you're going to have an extreme amount of prey that can live in the environment. So now we're going to talk about the food chain, starting with the primary producers. Now primary producers produce their own food. We know that those are phototrophs that create all the food they need through photosynthesis. Next are primary consumers that eat the primary producers. You are familiar with organisms that eat plants. They're called herbivores. Next are secondary consumers, which are carnivores, and they can also be herbivores or omnivores. So this one includes all of them, because those can eat the primary producers or your primary consumers. Now your tertiary consumers are on the top of the food chain, and they eat secondary consumers. Basically, it's just carnivores eating mostly other carnivores. Decomposers, as we talked about with fungi, eat dead material, and scavengers eat waste and remains of dead organisms. So remember, there's more biomass, more organisms, and more energy as you go down the food pyramid. So there's this rule called the 10% rule, which means that 10% of the energy is transferred from one level to the next, and the other 90% of that energy is used to power the organism that is consuming. Gradual change in an ecological community is called ecological succession. succession. Pioneer organisms are the first ones that start living in an uninhabited area. Usually they're really tiny. They're like mosses, things like that. And your climax community is what's left after succession has progressed to as far as it can go. So this is like your trees, your huge plants. So now we're going to get a little bit bigger and talk about ecosystems. So ecosystems include abiotic or non-living and biotic factors, which are living factors. So it's important to be familiar with three cycles, 
and this is the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle before we begin talking about ecosystems, because these include your abiotic factors. Most of the water on Earth is found in oceans, and most of it is taken into clouds via evaporation and transpiration, and it returns to the ocean via precipitation. So this is your basic third grade water cycle. Water in the soil goes back to the oceans through runoff, and that's pretty much what you need to know about water. Carbon is found as carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and it is used by plants to form sugars through photosynthesis. Once the plants die and the animals who eat the plants die, all the carbon within them returns back to the soil and the cycle starts over again. Nitrogen is necessary to produce protein because it is found in all amino acids. So nitrogen is mostly fixed by bacteria like we talked about in our plant video. And it is the plants are then consumed by animals and then as the plants and animals die, the nitrogen is recycled back into the soil and the cycle continues again. So next we're going to talk about biomes. Most biomes are terrestrial and animal life is referred to as fauna and when I say flora I mean plant life. All biomes make up the biosphere collectively. So now we're going to break down all the different types of biomes. So a tundra is characterized by permanently frozen topsoil and this is found in northern parts of North America, Europe, and Asia. And so because of this frozen topsoil you can't really get a lot of deep roots for plants, so there are very few trees. Most plants include small grasses and mosses, and few mammals live there, such as wolves. The taiga is a coniferous forest, so it's like any type of tree with like cones on it of some sort, not really your flowering trees. So the fauna includes small animals like squirrels, and large herbivores like deer, and really large carnivores such as a grizzly bear. Now you have the deciduous forest which I really like the name of because I think where it came from is the fact that you have seasons that are decided in a sense. So you don't have a gray area. Is it cold? Is it hot? You have a distinctive hot and you have a distinctive cold season. Now the trees here are characterized based on the fact that they lose their leaves in the winter and regrow them in the spring. So again, it's like you know exactly what season it is. The grasslands or the savanna is characterized by low growing plants, few scattered trees, and drought. They have large herbivores such as elephants in the tropical savanna and in the temperate savanna fauna include bison and antelope. Tropical rainforests have very high rainfall, <laughs> surprise surprise. The greatest diversity of flora and fauna are found in tropical rainforests. They have very tall trees, vines, and canopies. The desert is the driest of the biomes. Animals and plants are adapted to the arid environment and include cacti and snakes. And that ends our discussion on the terrestrial biomes. So now we're going to talk about the aquatic ones. The intertidal zone is the biome where land and salt water meet and has alternating periods of dry and complete submersion based on where the water is. Organisms include sponges, crabs, and starfish. Next is the neuritic zone, which extends from the intertidal zone to the edge of the continental shelf. And this includes sea urchins, seaweed, and fish. Now the oceanic zone is basically open ocean and there are many large free-swimming animals that often feed on one another. This biome can be divided into the pelagic, which is the open water, and the benthic, which is the ocean bottom. And quick fact, the deepest portion of the ocean is called the abyssal zone. Next is the littoral zone, which is a freshwater zone found near the shores of lakes. The limnetic zone is far from the shore and extends as far down as light will penetrate. So this includes several photosynthetic organisms. Your profundal zone is the aphotic region of the lake where nutrients float down to support primary and secondary consumers. Now we're going to talk about how humans have killed our environment. The greenhouse effect is where atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide via the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation have warmed the earth, and this can cause glaciers to melt and changes to both animal and plant populations. Ozone depletion is caused by chemicals in things such as typical aerosol cans, but the ozone layer is actually extremely important because it protects us from a lot of our ultraviolet radiation, and the more we destroy it, the more likely all of us are to get cancer. Acid rain causes populations to react with droplets of water in the clouds and they form sulfuric and nitric acids and this will lower the pH of all the aquatic ecosystems we just talked about and the soil which is really bad for a lot of organisms that can't survive in a pH that is lower than they're used to. 
Desertification, which is when the land is overgrazed, and this will reduce the carrying capacity of the environment. Again, super bad. Deforestation, as you know, is when you chop off all the forests, but this can cause changes in weather patterns and erosion. We're also super terrible because we pollute the earth a ton, and we have reduced biodiversity greatly. That's why we have an endangered species list now, because habitats have become destroyed. 